29, Cape Town. Frustration turns to desperation. With a truck convoy out of communication range in an uncharted wasteland, officials turn to the only alternative, another rescue from the air. They choose a veteran combat pilot, Major Mathis Ace. Three years earlier, Ace had crash-landed on the Skeleton Coast, living for seven days on a handful of oranges and morning dew licked from the wings of his plane. If anyone understands the plight of the castaways, it's Ace. Ace targets a narrow ridge called Rocky Point, 50 miles south of the wreck of the Dunedin Star. his destination. Treacherous cliffs abutted by hard, flat desert. Here he can land and take off again. Ace scouts the area further. He then sees what no one has ever seen in the sands of the skeleton coast. Truck tracks. He lands in time to share in another man's triumph. After eight days and 300 miles, Pump Smith is the first man to bring motorized vehicles to the Skeleton Coast. The air and overland rescuers meet. They are still 50 miles from the shipwreck, as close as the big Ventura can get. Smith must bring the castaways back here by truck so Ace can fly them to safety. This is their only hope. For 10 days, the castaways of the Dunedin Star have been victims of a cruel fate. Today, their luck will finally begin to turn. And luck's messenger is the young signalman aboard the Nareen, Dennis Scully. The tiny minesweeper has returned for an audacious rescue. The only way we're going to do this is somebody must take a line ashore. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And that was it. There was a, a couple of moments when the fellows in the boat couldn't see me. They uh, lost sight of my head and they thought I'd gone under and they started to haul me in again. But little did they know I was swimming furiously to the beach. escape for anyone strong enough to pull himself along it. The first mate of the Van Eden Star was the senior man ashore. Um, said that those who wished to attempt to go out on the rope to the anchored boat could do so. Fourteen men make the attempt. All of them reach the Nareen. Now, Scully's line is used to guide a lifeboat to take off the women, the children, and the elderly. So we brought the boat in, and then the orders were for everybody to get into it, which was the most ridiculous thing, because it, there were too many people. But orders were orders, so we got in, put our life jackets on. My mother was her grey coat and her black hat with the veil. We got into the boat, and then they started to pour it in. And we were just sitting ducks, we really were. Sitting and the boat couldn't move and they were trying to pull us in against the current. The passengers row with all their might toward the Nareen. Then, disaster. And this great huge wave got bigger and bigger and then it went up and it started to curl. The whole thing went crashing right on top of our boat underneath, pushed us up, sucked us underneath, everybody you know, out of the boat, the boat upside down. And then I came up for air and uh, at one moment and saw this little orange thing bobbing around. It was one of the little children in its big adult life jacket, but its face in the water. So I grabbed this little child and then I felt hands pulling us through the water. Miraculously, no one drowns. 
melting has been off. That was the most frightening thing of the whole shipwreck, as far as I'm concerned, was that one incident. Once again, the skeleton coast refuses to give up its prey. Almost two weeks in the blazing sun has scorched pink skin to scarlet. The feet were so burnt, it actually burst open like a, a sausage. My crew and I walked all the way down to the aircraft and got the burnt jelly out of the thing. But they couldn't walk, you know, they were actually paralyzed. medical supplies soon run out. Help must come, and soon. 17-year-old Jim Thompson decides on a dangerous act of bravado. He paddles out to the wreck on the dinghy from Nordea's aircraft. in a clean uniform and with supplies from the Dunedin Star's pantry. There was some champagne, actually, and some booze and some food. Night. All I remember, we all sitting around the fire, singing terrible, rude songs, and uh, passing the bottle around. We all felt very much better, you know. I mean, <laughs> I mean, physically and mentally, and you know, morally, we all felt much better. That sort of we were sort of feeling normal for a change. Next morning, day 13, reality returns. Five days, the pilot Ace has followed a daily ritual, flying over the castaways camp, dropping messages, telling of Smith's tortuous progress. The castaways barely take notice. Their hopes of rescue have been dashed too many times. And somebody said, what on earth? He said, look at them over there on the horizon. What is it? And we looked, and it was just a little... Uh, it looked like a puff of smoke, actually. And somebody said, oh, you know, it's a mirage, or don't bother. And we looked again, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you could vaguely see, you know, rather like a mirage, you know, little black things moving along, and it was the truck. Two miles from camp, Convoy grinds to a halt. Pump Smith walks the last stretch. Now, days of bottled up fear and frustration spill over in joyous relief. stretch of sand for two weeks their torment is left behind forever coming only six miles on the first day and 12 on the next we sometimes do a mile in the morning because eight trucks well oh, oh lorries one would bogged down in the sand and you'd get one lorry on you know going and then another one would go day 19 rocky point mathis ace finally spots what he has been waiting for 
After five days of struggle, the convoy arrives at last. Ace airlifts 18 women and children to safety. For the men, another adventure is just beginning. They must travel 300 miles by truck across the desert with Pump Smith. In a land that sees rain only a few times each decade, the African rivers are now swelled to overflowing. After three weeks with so little water, water is now their curse. The men slog through the flooded ravines. The rescued castaways travel by train to Cape Town. Annabelle Taylor and her mother reunite with Dunedin Star's Captain Lee, who has been waiting for three weeks to learn the fate of his passengers. Emmons Nodea is ordered to reclaim the expensive American aircraft he left stranded on the skeleton coast. After days of digging, the big Ventura is ready for takeoff. Airborne, Nodia believes he has finally seen the last of the coast of death. I took off next morning. That was okay. And about after about that, I should say 25 minutes flying. The chap sitting next to me said to me, sir, he says your engine is smoking. And I looked and I saw the engine pouring smoke. I said, oh, good God. Ventura nose dives into the sea. I'll never forget the sound. I'll never forget that sound. It was like an explosion. Nordea's legs are badly injured, but he manages to reach shore. The fellow standing next to me, believe it or not, he went through the floor and came out through the bomb bay downstairs. There was not cutting any bombs, of course. He went through the bomb bay. And the fellow sitting here next to me, he went right through the perspex in front. I don't know how we got away with it. Despite his heroism, Nodia is discharged from the Air Force. Emmons Nodia dies in 1995. New Year's Eve, 1942. It's a bittersweet time. While some of the survivors have reached Cape Town, they have no news of the fate of the others. We've had, you know, two months of adventure with great friends who were like our family. They weren't there. We didn't know where they were. And suddenly, at the end of this huge dining hall, these great, great big doors, which are double doors, you know, suddenly open. Boom. wonderful, wonderful New Year's Eve. We were all brought together. And it was the most wonderful ending to a really a, a, quite an adventure. Annabelle Taylor will marry a Canadian diplomat and spend many years in Africa. She now lives in Ottawa, Canada. Jimmy Thompson will rise to the rank of captain before retiring outside London, England. Dennis Scully, the brave young man who dared to take action, now makes action movies in Johannesburg, South Africa. Pump Smith would become an MP in the South African Parliament. The ravaged eyes of the children healed in time, and young Camilla Labib would become an eye specialist in Cairo, Egypt. Captain Lee would be found negligent for the wreck of the Dunedin Star and fired from the Blue Star Line. Later, he would open a pub in England. The rest of the crew of the Dunedin Star is reassigned to a sister ship, the Melbourne Star. Months after their narrow escape on the Skeleton Coast, the entire crew is lost. And their ship is sunk by a German submarine. savage 
wrecker of ships on the entire planet. These shores are littered with the remains of countless vessels, each with its own grim story to tell. so extraordinary as the tale of the Dunedin Star, one of the most dramatic but least known shipwrecks of the 20th century. Tomorrow on Discover Magazine, got the need for speed? Then hang on, as scientists reveal the key to beating time, from thoroughbreds to the fastest jet, speed, on Discover Magazine, only on the Discovery Channel. Next, Animal Life awakes as 